welcome back to the eighth and what is for now at least the final evolution live in this series i do love that introduction music so much um welcome back for those of you that have just missed the last two months hi uh, i'm dr Sila page i am uh, have a phd in evolutionary biology and every week for the last eight weeks on thursdays i have been teaching you evolution from a standing start with no assumptions of any background in biology but it's been building week on week and as um oxford terms where i did all of my studies are eight weeks long i figured that this is a good place to pause kind of reevaluate and decide how i want to continue um i can see lots of famous famous people <laughs> familiar people in the chat as always i am trying to monitor the sound the video the facts and presenting the comments everything all on my own so i get a little bit oh and there's a load of wildlife outside of my window that distracts me quite a lot actually um but yes hello to everyone joining and yes this is the last um evolution oh someone's seen all but the first one well if you have missed any of the previous uh classes seminars lectures i still don't know what to call them um they will all be available um later let me switch on to background music something a little calm and um here we go oh it's someone's first time well welcome if it is your first time um this time we are doing the evidence for evolution and i know this is the thing is that i know that all of you watching live in the comments will be lovely you have been for the last two months you've been really um having really good discussions asking really good questions being really polite talking about the the cesspool of the usual youtube audience when it comes to is evolution true well not even is evolution true but why is evolution true was the alternate title for this um video could be interesting so keep it clean in the comments please um and at the end of so it's an hour long lecture um, I'll be taking some time to answer some of your questions. I've been writing down a few to one side uh, to make sure I've got some good ones. I can see some good ones coming in. But for now, don't send me your questions just yet because I won't be able to read them and deliver information at the same time. So have a think about what questions you have based on the last eight weeks. And when I ask for it, you can type them all in then. Um, am I planning more live streams? Probably. It just it won't be this kind of weekly, regular format. Um, in part because I want to have some more time and brain space to do the old style of video that I did, um, where I'm making sciencey things and things like that. So taking a bit of a break from live lecturing to go back to making edited, uploaded videos. And I've got loads of ideas, so it should be fun. Now, oh, and as always. Thank you to those of you who have been supporting on Patreon. You have been a lifeline. Um, today was actually the first day that I've been able to claim money from the government for not being able to work. Uh, it's only taken them three months. So, so thank you to everyone who is, um, has been supporting on Patreon. But of course, this is free. Today, we will be doing the evidence for evolution. But last week, previously on Evolution Live, um, we were talking about phylogenetic trees so all life on earth shares a common ancestor we call that um the most recent common ancestor or there is the lowest common ancestor and we can draw the relationships between species on this thing called a phylogenetic tree which is just like a family tree but for species instead of just family members and these trees are based on multiple lines of evidence we we're looking at morphology and dna in particular last week and not only are they based on evidence, they can also give us evidence about when and why certain adaptations evolve. And you may remember that last time we had an awful lot of chocolate bars. So that was fun. I'm not gonna tell you how many of those chocolate bars still exist. That would be telling. So this time, we are looking at the evidence for evolution. And as you can imagine, as this has been something 
formally proposed in the 1860s and has been highly contested and highly challenged since, damn you, religion, um, there is an awful lot of evidence for evolution. Scientific ideas in general get strengthened the more we challenge them. That's how science works. You come up with an idea and then it's really weird. If a scientist thinks they've got a good idea, they will try their utmost best to disprove it, to prove themselves wrong, to do themselves not out of a job, but out of a good idea. And you can imagine that the anti-evolution people have been trying to disprove the idea of evolution an awful lot. And so far, it is still very much standing. And that is because there is so much evidence for evolution, overwhelming amount of evidence for evolution across multiple different lines of evidence. And what's amazing is that actually we don't need every single piece of evidence. So for example, we wouldn't need, even if we didn't have any fossils whatsoever, we would still have enough evidence for evolution. Um, so the, <laughs> I love it, people are saying that the chocolate bars weren't extinct. S at least some of them have, um, uh, and a size, sizable bars as well. Um, so yes, uh, remember that in normal general speak, something is a theory if it's a guess, and is a fact if you're darn sure it's true. In science, a hypothesis is a guess, and a theory is something that you are darn sure is true. And in biology, facts don't really exist. Well, we're always aiming for facts. As a, a scientist will very rarely tell you that something is a fact. In science speak, they will tell you that something, there is an overwhelming amount of evidence for it, which you can translate into general speakers. It is a fact. And so we know that evolution is a fact. The thing that is often contested is whether natural selection is the means of evolution. Um, so the first point we're going to do, and there's gonna be lots of pictures, less drawing, more pictures in this one. Um, anatomy evidence. So there is a whole line of anatomical evidence. So the thing we're trying to prove, or I suppose that you can't prove anything in science, you can only disprove. The thing we're showing that it is hard to disprove. This is why scientists have such a difficult time. I'm just gonna take a tangent. Scientists have such a difficult time communicating because in our heart, we know it is inaccurate to say that we're trying to prove evolution because technically we're not. We're trying to, we're trying to disprove it and failing. But in general speak, we're trying to prove evolution. So the thing we're trying to prove is that um, once life had started on Earth, evolution does not talk about the origin of life, as I'll mention. Someone had a question about that. Um, once life had started on Earth, um, all of life that we see now originates from this common ancestor and there has been change over huge swathes of time that mean that now each individual evolved from another one um, caused by random mutation and non-random death, that is selection, and that is how we see um, so-called apparent design in nature because things have naturally, random, non-randomly, but spontaneously been selected to be a better fit for their environment. And in the last seven weeks, we've talked about how that happens, what that means, um, what that results in. This is just the evidence. So, notebook, Evolution Live number eight, the final countdown. So we're gonna start off within anatomy with homology. So this may be somewhat familiar to some of you. And uh, let me get out of rainbow pen. So we've got homology. And <laughs> poor Stuart940 has been correcting me on my etymology for the last many weeks because I keep on getting things wrong. 
because I love etymology, but I never look it up before I do these. So um, I'll say homo, I know, means same as opposed to hetero, which means different. And ology means study of. So study of things being the same. Homology is looking at, so homologous, first it is different to analogous. So homology and analogy are different things. If something is analogous, it has the same function, but might be, the underlying structure might be completely different. So for example, a bat's wing and a dragonfly's wing and a bird's wing are all analogous structures because they all are means flappy things that help you fly. But when you look at the actual structure, they're completely different. They have a completely different origin. Homologous structures, however, are things that are the same. They have this, they are the same thing from one to the next because they share this common ancestry, but may have changed for a slightly different purpose. So it started off meaning uh, being the same thing and has diverged into slightly different uses. So here we're looking at the four limbs of four limbs. Oh my god, what a great joke that was. Um, I'm in a great mood today. It must be because the sun is shining, you know? So we have our four limbs presented on the screen here. And we also have four limbs. Um, so this one on the left, if you can't read it, is human. This is dog. This is bird. And this is whale. Now, of course, these are all vertebrates. They're all um, land not land, they're all animals with bony skeletons. And they, people of Wikipedia have very kindly colored in the homologous structures. So we've got the radius and ulna are the two bones in our forearm. And you can see how they are, all, there are also two bones in uh, dogs, birds, and also in whales, even though they don't necessarily have it longer so in whales it's been really condensed down because if you imagine in a whale this is actually a fin so the rest of the um the non-bony bit looks like that whereas in a bird we might have feathers here um like that and in a dog you've got your paw <laughs> and obviously human has a hand so even though a whale doesn't need extra space between the wrist and the elbow, it still has these two bones. And okay, humans, we've got a whole load of wrist bones. Um, those are colored in yellow. You can see that they're the same across. Um, and what I think is most interesting is that we've got five digits on our hands. And you can see them in the dog, so our finger bones, what, when you see a dog's paw, what you're actually looking at is the dog's fingers. And you'll often see a really weird, tiny little toe, kind of almost halfway up the foot. And that's an extra um, finger, um, or it's where the other missing finger has gone. And their wrist isn't where... So if you imagine a dog's foot looks like that, that is not their wrist. Their wrist is up here somewhere, and you can see that based on looking at the actual bones. Um, birds have it similar, they've got, they've elongated their fingers like a, a fan um, to make it look like that. And whales, so whales obviously have fins, they could have any number of structures inside there. And so homology tells us, so why would whales, why would all of these things have come up and made five fingers the norm and two bones like why would a whale have chosen two bones in that position and not one had they not come from the same thing so homology as a line of evidence for evolution is why would we see all of these similarities in the structure some of them are a bit nonsensical um if they didn't come from this shared ancestry so all of these limbs came from one shared limb and evolved from that. And an even more striking example is the whale. So this is, we'll talk, be talking a lot about whales in this episode. This is the baleen whale. And um, it may come as a surprise to you, but I'm going to tell you that whales have legs. 
And you may be thinking, Sally, you are absolutely ridiculous. You've gone out of your mind. All of that chocolate has gone to your head. I can quite clearly see on that picture that that whale has four, has front flippers, but it has no legs. Well, actually, if, <laughs> I just realized, well, actually, um, this is a baleen whale skeleton. So you can see it's got a huge mouth bit here. And so we can, if I zoom in on this, we can see how the, these are the five fingers. Like imagine if a whale had a human hand, that would be so weird. Um, and we've got the radius and the ulna. I may have got them the wrong way around. But this, these are leg bones. And so on the picture, oops, whales actually have leg bones here inside all of that blubber and so the question is okay if something other than natural selection had created whales why on earth would they stick leg bones in there why on earth would they put leg bones inside an animal that quite clearly doesn't need leg bones the answer is because the whale evolved from other animals that did need leg bones. It evolved from something that looked like this. Because of course whales are mammals, they're not fish. So early tetrapods started off in the water many, 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 many millions of years ago, evolved to walk and breathe on land. Got your tiktalic, we talked about that before. But then some of those land mammals then went back into the water. It's also why, interestingly, whales go up and down like that in the same way that like a cheetah's spine goes up and down like that whereas a fish spine goes side to side how on earth did it take them so long to realize that whales were mammals and not fish but um the thing that went back into the water looked a little bit like that i can't work out if it's cute or kind of terrifying but you can see that it's got our five one two three four five fingers um, and the webbing is already helping to um, make them more aquatic. That eventually turns into these five fingers up here. And it has back legs, which turn into these back legs here. So that is homology. Um, we also have, so we also have, these are vestigial structures, I should say. Um, vestigial. So these are remnants of evolution. These are literally the breadcrumbs left behind from evolution. So legs used to be adaptive in the whale and we see what remains of what used to be adaptive. It hasn't had enough time in evolutionary time to get rid of them yet. And it's not just whales. Humans have vestigial structures too. So here is a human pelvis. This one on the left is facing towards us. This one on the right is facing to the right before you start commenting. And the thing in red is obviously the coccyx. And we call it the tailbone. Like you may have sat down on a hard surface and gone, oh, I've broken my tailbone. Because it is literally a tailbone. Um, as humans, we evolved from animals that have longer tails, like earlier primates had longer tails. And we didn't need our tails, we've evolved out of our tails. But we haven't got rid of them entirely yet, because you can't just be like, oh, I'm just gonna chop this tail off and throw it away. It has to sh slowly shrink and no longer grow. But I mean, having a tailbone isn't too much of a detriment to humans. It doesn't affect our evolutionary fitness that much, how good we are at surviving and reproducing. And so it's not being got rid of very quickly. It's there, it's disappearing, but there's no great hurry for it to go. It can just, you know, do its own little thing. It's all tucked in inside the pelvis, it'll be fine. That is vestigial structures. We also, within, so the final thing within anatomy is embryology. So here's a bit of a quiz for you. Um, this 
is so this is a fish embryo um, at an early stage and at a slightly later stage and these things here are what we call gill slits These go on to be the gills in a fish that breathe oxygen through the water. Except this isn't, I lied to you, this isn't a, um, a fish embryo. This is actually a tortoise embryo. Um, so what this is actually at the same levels of development, respectively, so like scaling up the pregnancy. This is a fish embryo. And again, you can see here the gill slits. Except that actually I'm still lying to you. That isn't a fish embryo. That is a chicken embryo. And obviously chickens don't have gills, but their embryos do. So this is actually what a fish embryo looks like for comparison and once again we have these gill slits oops gill slits except guess what i am lying to you again this is a human embryo um this is chicken and this is tortoise and they all have gill slits as embryos. Humans evolve, um, humans grow in the womb starting off with gill slits. We don't get rid of them because obviously we then don't need them. Um, but just, uh, I love how I was like, oh, not again. Um, oh, silly Sally. This is a, a lovely comparative um, here. I'm just gonna cover up those bottom ones because they're not so relevant. These are a load of different um, vertebrates at comparing the relevant stages of evolution. So what might be, uh, sorry, relevant stages of embryology. And you can see how from fish, salamander, tortoise, chicken, um, pig, uh, cow, rabbit, and human, they all have these gill slits. And why on earth, if you were creating a human from scratch, would you make it go through the effort of building gill slits as an embryo only to then get rid of them? Look, humans, no gill slits. And guess what? It's because we evolved from, we all evolved from things that had gill slits. And rather than undoing what had been done before, you can only build on top of. Um, we call it contingency. So imagine you've got a broken down car you need to improve the engine, but you've got to improve the engine whilst the car is driving. This is what evolution has to do. It has to continuously improve the thing without at any point causing it to be worse in the previous iteration. It's frankly a miracle that all of this happens. Maybe miracle was not the best choice of word to use there, but it is amazing that all of this happens. Um, so yeah, imagine trying to turn your old rickety rusty car into a Formula One car while it is driving. That is what evolution has to do. And so that's why it can't go back to the drawing board and start again. It has to build on what it's got. So actually, rather than messing around and getting rid of the building the gill slit bit, it is a lot easier for evolution. Obviously I'm giving evolution here agency and purpose and personifying it when it is not a person, it is a, a product of random and non-random actions. Um, it's much easier for evolution to say, oh, okay, we'll just build the gill slits to begin with, we'll keep that the same and we'll deal with them later on down the line, we'll get rid of them later, just keep doing what you're doing for now. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So that is um, anatomy. We now have fossil evidence, which is probably the one that people first think of when they think of evidence for evolution would be um, fossils. And that's because it is kind of cool. So there are two parts to fossils. Firstly, more complex species always 
come after less complex species. Um, famously, so as science, we always want our hypotheses to be disprovable. If you can't disprove it, you can't do science with it. Um, there must be, a, it must be a falsifiable idea. There must be a way of being able to prove that it's wrong because otherwise there's no way, because we can't prove that something is right, we can only not prove it's wrong. If it's physically impossible to prove something wrong, you can't assume it's right. And one of the ways that you could disprove evolution, and there are ways in which you could disprove evolution, is if we were, so the famous quote is, to find fossil rabbits in the Precambrian. If we were to find modern day animals in the same fossil layers as Precambrian was, age, Precambrian was before we had interesting life. I mean, a lot of it was probably jelly, so it didn't fossilize too well, but we're talking long before the first animals. If we were to find a modern rabbit then, uh, we'd be like, okay guys, we had a lot of evidence for evolution, but none of it matters because we found this. And um, so fossils come in layers, like a cake or an onion. And so that allows us to date them. And it's not necessarily that modern animals are more complex, but there is, they, there is, an, uh, there is an order. So you can't suddenly evolve the entire bony skeleton from having no concept of bone beforehand. You can't go straight from a single-celled organism to a rabbit in evolution without having steps in between. That's not how evolution works. So if we were to see complete rabbit mixed in with no other gap in between, we'd be like, oh my God, guys, something's gone wrong. But we can see um, fossils in their layers. Um, so one of the greats, I do love Wales because, I mean, I love Wales, the country, and I'm kind of gutted I can't be there at the moment because, yeah, I adore whales. But this is the evolution of the whale. And um, these are the fossil steps we have that go from each one, which I think is fascinating. And I've actually got some pictures of the fossils themselves. And you can really see how it started off as a land animal. And um, so up here, this is very much a land animal. And then it evolved into something that still has four legs, so a bit like an otter really. It's a land animal that is very good at swimming to something that um, now has these teeny tiny leg bones at the end. This is still not a whale, this is this one here. That is that one there. And that is that one there. I couldn't find a good picture of that one. Um, so we, so the theory of evolution by natural selection says that we should see these incremental steps between one form to another because there is a progression, not necessarily progress, but things start off in one way and then through incremental changes become a different way. And those things die and get fossilized. And so we should see those in-between stages. And here we see these in-between stages from a land animal to a water animal. Oh, look, why would we see these things in the past and not now if someone was spontaneously creating them? Hmm, I wonder. Um, okay, so that is fossils. DNA evidence. Back in week two, I think, I was talking about DNA and mutations and things like that and we played a fantastic game of mutation bingo and all of that was to talk about how DNA is a language. DNA is a code written in chemicals that can be translated into making the instructions for making proteins and that's all it is. All of life on this planet that we know because so far we do not know of life on other planets. All of life 
uses this code. There are some very slight subtleties, whether you're using DNA or RNA, but those are like sister chemicals. It'd be like speaking UK English versus US English. There are subtleties there, but they're very closely linked. So all of life uses this same language. And so if you were coming up with these things completely independently, it would be rather, if you were to randomly create life many times, it would be very, very unlikely that you would stumble across the same language each time. Um, and we see the same, not only is the language the same, but the words and the instructions are the same. And um, so we see the same genes across very diverse species. So the one we most commonly look at when we're doing, comparing very dissimilar things are ribosomes. So ribosomes are tiny little structures inside a cell alongside the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. The ribosomes um, take the genetic information in the form of RNA and they use that to actually make the proteins. The ribosomes are the ones that stick those amino acids together, if you remember that from week two, and they, um, they stitch them together to make proteins. And because life is based on proteins, pretty much, that all of life, pretty much, there are, when you get really, like, do you define a virus as living? Viruses still rely on protein, on ribosomes, just not necessarily their own. Um, but all of life has ribosomes or uses ribosomes. And we can directly compare them and they are pretty much the same across everything from bacteria to, um, to uh, fungi, to plants, to animals. All the way across the tree of life, we see ribosomes performing the same role in the same way. And what's even better is we can use the fact that um, we could have these same structures, these homologous structures across huge swathes of life and compare them and we can make phylogenetic trees between them like we saw last week and these DNA based trees so purely looking at the chemistry matches up with how we would make trees using morphology for example so if I was to look at a um, I'm looking out the window at a blue tit and a great tit, they look much more similar to each other than either of them does to a golden eagle. And guess what? The DNA evidence also matches. So you've got these two different lines of evidence where you can draw evolutionary relationships between them. You can do that independently of each other and then compare them and be like, hey, we've got the same relationships, like twice as likely that that is the evolutionary relationship. Next one. I'm going quite fast because I want to have time for some of your questions. Um, predictive models. But I am going to take a sip of squash. So we often don't think of biology as being a predi particularly predictive science because Oh my God, there is so much variation in biology. Biology as a science, as a thing to study is so messy. Like bless physicists and they're like, oh no, our error rate is like 0.0000001. We're very concerned about how messy our data is. And biologists are like, what? We are literally dealing with the mess that is life here. And so it can be quite difficult to accurately make predictions in biology. We can say that there is going to be a trend for this to happen, but we can't say at any one time, this is where this animal is going to be behaving in this way, precisely for these reasons. But it is still a predictive science. We can use our theory. Remember that, so we can use our hypothesis that natural selection is true 
which is now scientifically a theory like we can test is natural selection true by taking what we know about natural selection and saying well if our theory was true what behavior would we expect to see and then afterwards test it and see hey maybe it was true maybe it wasn't true and that is basically how sorry i just saw someone say assume the spherical whale because yes we do not um treat our animals as frictionless spheres in a vacuum and um, with concentrated mass down to a single point no we don't we we absorb all of that um complexity into our models so science is biology can be predictive and so we're not quite as predictive because there's so much going on but i thought i'd briefly touch on a few examples um because they're fun and these are all in social evolution because that's my area so this is a fig an immature fig like the figs you eat and these are wasps. You may be thinking, Sally, that is the grossest thing I've ever seen, but these are fig wasps. So if you imagine a fig, it's kind of that shape, and it's got that little hole in the bottom, and that's where the wasps fly in. And then they lay their eggs, and then these hatch. They have sex inside your fig and then they come out the hole. Well, some of them do. Some of them die inside. And then you eat the fig. Enjoy figs. I love figs though, they're great. Um, yes, this is, thank you, figure one. So, that's fig wasps. And so they've got this really unusual setup where usually all of these figs, all of these figs, all of these wasps inside the fig are actually siblings because only one mum went into the fig and then so laid all of her eggs. And so all of those eggs are siblings of each other and they, um, and then they mate and they come out. And so we get these really weird sex ratios. So the amount of males versus the amount of females. But we have predictions for this and I can't go into this a lot and I will make a video about this at some point, but it's called local mate competition. And it's a branch of evolutionary theory. And unfortunately, because obviously the broader the theory, the less it can predict. Um, so I can't just be like, oh, we've got all of evolution. If you want to predict a specific behavior, you've got to have a specific piece of theory to predict it. Um, and specifics take time to build up to and to explain, which is why I haven't quite, um, which is why I haven't quite got around to explaining local mate competition, sex allocation, all of that stuff. But it is fascinating. Um, but basically, it says that the number of um, mothers, mothers, families, it's all one and the same thing. So uh, this is the sex ratio. So you can imagine that this is 50%. So this is 50-50 males and females. And you start off and you got like this. What theory would predict is that when you have a very small number of mother wasps going into the fig, you have a lot of females, so a very low sex ratio. And then as it goes, as you get more and more and more mothers, that becomes more like a normal situation and it gets closer and closer to 50%. And guess what? That is exactly what we see in fig wasps. It is fascinating how similar it is so the variation looks something like this um, so there is a little bit of variation around it so like that might be a fig and that might be a fig and that might be a fig and you get a fig and you get a fig and you get a fig and everybody gets a fig with wasps inside of it so there is still variation because this is biology after all but it was such a good predict I think it predicts something like 10% of the variation which to you might not sound like a lot as a biologist we're like what this is 
never happens to us that one theory can predict so much of the variation. Um, so that's local mate competition. And uh, then we have, this is honeybees. And this is honeybees having sex. Um, poor bee, you're watching as the suicidal act of a dying male bee here because as if you don't already know, I do say it a lot, um, honeybee males are useless, they are flying testicles, they have sex, their testicles explode and they die. And then the female kind <laughs> of carries around the testicles for a while, absorbs all the sperm and then goes about her life never mating again. And <laughs> to me that's so matter of fact and some people are just like, what? What did you just say? So we can use evolutionary theory to even predict when animals will make mistakes. I find this fascinating. So because normally all the bees in a hive come, they all come from the same mother, the queen, but usually the queen only makes one, so they all have the same father. So they're pretty inbred and, or not, not inbred, they're, they're all very closely related. And so they all smell the same and chemical communication scent is how bees interact with each other a lot of the time. Um, but sometimes there are rival hives. So you've got like two households, two hives, both alike in dignity. Um, but civil hand, civil blood makes civil hands unclean, I think. Um, and so you've got rival hives and sometimes workers from one will try and attack the other hive. But they're, they're able to actually detect that they're from a different hive and fight them off because of course the females are amazing and some of them are superstars and are able to defend the nest as workers, as one of their castes. And they're able to do that by smelling the difference between them. And so they're like, you don't smell like you're from my family, so I'm gonna get rid of you. But when the hives are related by chance, it could be that um, they are, so that they've got um, two brother males and the two fathers of each one. Or it could just be that this male makes hives that smell like apples and a completely unrelated male makes um, hives and makes offspring that smell like apples even though they're unrelated and the similarity between them makes it really hard for those defenders to protect to work out who is the same and who is different who is from their hive and who's from a different hive who's an invader and so they make mistakes and they don't defend the nest against these in invaders because they think they can't tell by smelling that they're different. And we can predict that. How cool is that? Um, okay, I'm getting very excited about social evolution and I don't have time to do it justice. There may be an Evolution Live series too. I'm not saying no to that. Um, okay, so we've got predictive models. We can see evolution in action. One of the things that annoys me so much when people say that they don't believe in evolution is we can literally see it. Um, so all of this started with good old Darwin. Love a bit of Darwin. He did such a good job. He spent such a long time thinking about it and he did, he was so rigorous. Wallace may have been good but Darwin was more rigorous. And as I have found out when trying to read The Origin of Species, God, he talks about pigeons a lot. He spends three chapters talking about pigeons because in his day, pigeon fancying was a big thing for the aristocracy. Pigeon fancying meaning breeding fancy pigeons. Um, and what fancy pigeons they were. These are actual pigeons that have been bred to look fancy. If you want some fun, just Google search of fancy pigeons and you get them. How ridiculous, like look at this. They've got like little um, 
Elizabethan ruffs on them. This one's got like a peacock's tail. And this one's got this huge throaty thing and it's all leggy. Like, why does it have so much leg? And this one's like a poodle with curly bits. Like, weird. And these have all been bred. These have been artificially selected because we knew, we have known for a long time that if you take individuals with traits that you want, so let's talk about Mr. Ruff here, Mr. and Mrs. Fluffy Necks. If you take pigeons with fluffy necks, if you take the pigeons with the most fluffy necks and you breed them together, you get offspring with fluffy necks. That's genetics. But then if you keep doing that and keep only selecting from your pen, only picking out the ones with the fluffiest necks, over time you will get fluffier and fluffy necks. That is breeding. Farmers have been doing this for millennia. But guess what? It's still evolution. Just because it's a human doing it doesn't stop it being evolution. It means it's not really natural selection, it's artificial selection, but it's all within the umbrella of evolution. And so um, this is kind of bigger scale stuff, but obviously evolution happens on evolutionary timescales. It, it occurs over hundreds and thousands of generations, which when you're human and you're looking at human generations is millennia. And one human cannot observe millennia's worth of evolution, but Generations, like that Doctor Who episode, has just come to mind, where they're like, oh, going back 500 generations, we've been starting this war, but it turns out that for them, a generation time is like an hour, and they've only been at war for five days or something stupid. That maths didn't work out. I'm sure you can do it. Well, guess what? In um, bacteria, bacteria have got really short generation times, and so we can watch the equivalent of millennia in a single human lifespan. And so to just show you what you're looking at, um, this yellow stuff is bacteria. And this plate used to be completely full of bacteria, you call it a bacterial lawn. And then scientists popped these little discs onto the agar plate full of bacteria. And these are um, coated with different antibiotics. And so these are dead bacteria, or more accurately, these are where bacteria couldn't grow. And so they grew all the way up to here, but then couldn't get any further. The antibiotic is like a force field that stops them growing. But what's going on here is that these bacteria on the plate are resistant to this particular antibiotic. They have evolved resistance because before they didn't have it not bacteria did not or used to be resistant to penicillin and methicillin and amoxicillin and all of the antibiotics that we have they have just evolved it and we have seen that happening we still see it happening and it is a huge problem and people say oh it's just microevolution i mean for a start Bacteria, their adaptations are chemical. They are the chemistry masters of life. People think that they're simple, but they, are, they can do the most complicated chemical reactions that we can't even begin to think of doing. Most of the time, if you want a really complicated chemical reaction, we now look to bacteria or yeast to do it for us. The way we make, um, um, what's the stuff you take for diabetes? Um, insulin we can't make synthetic insulin very easily so the way we first did it just breed up a load of microorganisms to do it we did the same thing for penicillin just breed up a load of microorganisms to do it, it takes ages to work out how to do it in a lab but these tiny little things are so complicated in their chemistry that they are super successful just because they're small just because they're structurally simple doesn't mean they're not chemically complex and incredibly successful. Um, standing up for the underdogs, where the underdogs are single-celled organisms. Um, so for them, evolving antibiotic resistance is not microevolution. This is big stuff. 
Um, this is huge for them. And microevolution, there's no difference between microevolution and macroevolution. So for those that haven't come across it um, online, uh, microevolution is supposedly tiny things that don't on the grand scale make a big difference. Whereas macroevolution is creating new species. And people say, oh, well, I accept that microevolution happens, but I don't think that macroevolution happens through natural selection. Guess what? Microevolution is just evolution that hasn't been given enough time yet. The process is exactly the same. If you were a pointiest painter, it would be like saying that drawing a single dot is a different process to making a picture. No, you've just got to draw an awful lot of dots and then you will get a picture. Microevolution, given a huge amount of time, is going to lead to bigger scale evolution. Um, I love it. Someone in the comments has just said, um, microevolution, the argument, is like saying you can take a step but it's impossible to go for a walk. Exactly just got to do it, iterate it over and over again. Yes, it takes a huge amount of time. Guess what? Life has been around for a huge amount of time. Um, and people say, oh, but humans are different. Humans are not different. We're animals. We're a bit boring as animals go. Um, but humans are still evolving. This is uh, a picture of someone from the Bajau tribe, and they have evolved larger pank, no, larger spleens because they, as a culture, do a huge amount of free diving. So like scuba diving, but without any of the fancy equipment. They literally hold their breath for 10 minutes underwater to do spear fishing. They live in the coastal regions of Indonesia. I suppose all of Indonesia is a coastal region, isn't it? It's an island range. Um, but for generations, they have been um, fishing underwater by free diving and it helps to have a bigger spleen because the spleen holds blood and blood holds oxygen so having a bigger spleen means you've basically got an oxygen tank with you that you can push into the rest of the body to give yourself more oxygen when you're underwater and um and this this has evolved they actually have anatomically bigger spleens than pretty much anyone else in the world uh, we also get huge things, so this one's a little bit more contested, but Europe, so it's known that Europeans, about 10% of Europeans are resistant to the virus HIV. Obviously HIV causes AIDS, this is a huge problem, but they're like, why have Europeans or Caucasians got this genetic resistance that other groups around the world don't have? And the biggest idea at the moment is because in the 1600s, and for an awful lot of time, humans in Europe were going through a very large selective pressure called the Black Death. And the Black Death killed about 25%, a quarter of all humans in Europe. Now, if that isn't a mortality risk, I don't know what is. And obviously a huge amount of death gives a huge opportunity for natural selection to occur. Because if you were one of the three and four that um, that had some genetic resistance to the plague, you were much more likely to survive and go on to reproduce. That would be a huge advantage. So we're not sure whether it was the plague or smallpox um, was one of the driving factors for this resistance gene. But there's so many plagues, not necessarily the plague, but plagues in Europe, that there would have been a huge selective pressure just 400 years ago. That's not that many generations ago. That's what, uh, 20, that's not right, uh, 40, 400, 400 divided by 20. Let's cross off. Yeah, 20 generations. That is not a long time. 20 generations for fruit flies would probably be about a year's worth of evolution. For bacteria, you could get through 20 generations in a day, optimal conditions. So 
just in the 400 years since the Black Death, humans have evolved this, um, Europeans have evolved this genetic resistance to plague-like diseases. And it just so happens that those um, genes also, by chance, provide some resistance to HIV. We don't know if HIV was around at the time or not. There are, there are still questions, but it shows that humans are still evolving as a species. So those are my five reasons why evolution is true. The fact that I even have to defend it so much annoys me. I'm not going to lie, it does. You don't see pretty much any other field of science, climate science is now coming into its own, but every other field of science doesn't have to spend huge vast amounts of time arguing with people that their science is true. Unfortunately, evolution does as a field, but there is a lot of evidence. And of course, any one of these evidence would, uh, these lines of evidence would provide a huge amount of support for the idea of evolution by natural selection. Combine them all together and you have got one heck of a strong theory in both senses. And for something to disprove evolution, it's possible and it's important that it's possible to disprove it makes it science and not faith um but my god we can be pretty darn sure that this is at least somewhat correct um technically we only have about two more minutes but i'm going to extend it as it is the final one um and answer some of your questions imagining this is office hours so feel free to comment, but I've also got some to get me started. Oh, so first I would like a big shout out to Stuart940, who has very patiently been correcting my etymologies. So just so you know, philo, as in phylogeny, does not mean tree, because I was thinking of phyto rather than phylo. Phyto means plant, philo means race or tribe. Um, and Jenny does not mean birth from Genesis. And sorry, it, yeah, Jenny does not mean life like Genesis. It means to be born. So phylogeny is the birth of tribes. Thank you. And also um, Patrick, as in hello Patrick or Sim Patrick. Remember when we were talking about speciation? Um, so Patrick, like patriarchy, means father, but the way we get land, because remember that allopatric was when species evolved um, on different patches of land, there was a physical separation, so different land. Patrick also means fatherland, which is how we get that. So thank you for those corrections, I do appreciate them. Um, Daniel asked in a previous comment, didn't recent research show peacock tail feathers had more to do with deterring big cats? which are afraid of their eye spots. This is interesting. Um, back in our sexual selection lecture, we were talking about why peacocks have big tails. And I presented that it's because females find big tails sexy. And for a variety of reasons, that means that you get bigger and bigger tails and things like that. Um, and so it's possible, so it's possible that the eye spots themselves may have a role in deterring big cats, which are the main predators of peacocks. And obviously they really struggle to fly up into the air when they've got a massive tail. However, what you've got to remember is that only peacocks and not peahens have big tails. Um, the species, remember, is called peafowl. There is no such thing as a female peacock. It is a peacock and a peahen. If the tail feathers were to do with defense from predators, then you would see it in both males and females because both males and females have predators and need to avoid them. The fact we see them only in males gives us very good evidence that it's sexually selected, that there is a reason for the males to have it and not the females. It's possible that once they already had these big tails, eye spots, weren't as harmful as we initially thought them to be because remember we were talking about handicaps and so peacock's tails are a big handicap for the male and that's why they may have been chosen 
and so maybe having the eye spots makes them less of a handicap but still just predation alone would not create the big tails that we see in peacocks um oh there's a peacock emoji i did not know that um one from comment that was here at the start of the live stream from nils nyquist how do we know for certain that life started with one organism and not a bunch of them that competed went extinct or got merged along the way to pave the way for all organisms we know of today that is a great question and i think what is really important um to remember with evolution is that evolution is about change, not about creation. Evolution does not tell us how um, life started. Evolution tells us once life did start, how did it become everything that we see? So there is still, so yeah, natural selection will not tell you this is how life started. And so it is possible, it is certainly possible that um, life started multiple times but the only one of those origins went on to spawn all species that we know of today and that we have no that obviously it wouldn't fossilize those other groups that got out competed um however if the creation of life was that common we would expect to see it more often and so we would see spontaneous creation more than we do um so it is so if there was lots of life in one time then why would we not see lots of new forms of life popping up now so it is totally possible that that was the case um and we would not easily be able to say one way or the other um and part of that is because evolution is about once you've got life how does it grow? Right, taking comments from the live chat. Um, are there any sci-fi books, films, etc., that you've seen that have gotten evolution perfectly right or terribly wrong? I am not much of a sci-fi person. I yeah, as a genre, I'm I'm not too keen on it. Um, so I'm trying to actually think of some examples of evolution. The trouble is, is that with films, they have to condense so much into a short space of time that an evolution by definition happens over generations. And so you very often see individuals changing. So like superheroes evolve in the lay sense. Remember evolution in the lay sense just means change over time. So, sure, Spider-Man evolves from being human to being superhuman, um, but that's not biological evolution. Um, so, yeah, I really don't know. One biologically correct book, which is kind of related to evolution. I mean, social evolution adores honeybees and it's about honeybees, but it's called the bees i think i'm just going to look that up um but it is an absolutely fantastic yeah the bees by lillian paul is an absolutely fantastic fiction book it's a dystopic sci-fi adventure type thing but everyone is a bee <laughs> in a hive and it is so accurate it is astonishing you can tell how much research has been put into the book when you know enough about social evolution and honeybees i loved that um and makes a very big difference from the bee movie which i've given an entire talk about which you can see on my channel um pokemon does not predict pred uh, depict evolution accurately as far as i'm aware i never played pokemon it doesn't because the individuals evolve which isn't really evolution it's growth going through different stages in life, like a caterpillar to a pupa to a butterfly, evolution would be over many generations. Um, what else have we got? Lots of people talking about... Um, 
How and in what way has the study of evolution contributed to the innovation and betterment of our modern society and the people living in it? Interesting. Well, there's one way in which it hasn't helped and that's eugenics. <laughs> Let's just clear that now. Um, just because something happens in nature does not mean it's a good thing to base your moral principles on. Just because um, you see natural selection as so-called survival of the fittest does not mean that you should make people compete with each other. Um, so let's just clear social Darwinism out of the way. Um, evolution has... Our understanding of evolution means we understand life better. And guess what? Life is what we eat. Life is what... Um, we grow most of our resources from. Life is what often kills us in terms of disease. Um, and so to know about these things means we know more about food, resources and illness. Which I would say is kind of useful for society. We are able to grow better foods. We have evolved um, plants that can make better uses of resources. And our understanding of genes means we can now use genetic modification, which I think is this wonderful tool. I can't believe that in America they had to put this product includes GMOs on packaging and everyone's like, oh, I'm not going to touch it. If it was me and I saw this product contains GMOs, I'd be like, oh my God, that's so cool. So much science and hard work has gone into making that food. Uh, that's just me. Um, but there, so yeah, so we can do that. We are releasing sterile male mosquitoes into areas that have huge burden of malaria because we know that when the males so males all they do is seek out females and my god are they good at seeking out females they have these huge furry antennas their entire job is to smell out females so they can find mosquito females in a way that humans never could and obviously we want to stop females from being able to lay lots of eggs if we want to reduce the number of um, mosquitoes in the area. And counter, um, not counterproductively, but counterintuitively, releasing more mosquitoes ends up in reducing the number of mosquitoes. Because if you release sterile males, then all the females mate with those sterile males instead of the fertile males, and they end up with sterile eggs. And so you have a huge dip in the next generation. And, um, but obviously then you have a huge selective pressure. There is a huge advantage for females that can detect the difference between sterile and fertile males because any that couldn't don't reproduce. Um, and so all of these kind of things and disease resistance and fighting disease, being able to understand the evolution and the selective pressures that are behind it means that we don't, for example, release a whole load of mosquitoes and end up making the situation worse. And now we have mosquitoes that are super good at working out which ones are fertile or not. Um, like uh, introduced species, for example, we don't make those kind of mistakes. Um, a few more questions. Uh, I once heard that our ancestors lived in Africa and we all have African ancestry. Is that true? Yes, to the best of our knowledge. Um, so before modern humans, there were hominids, so human-like primates. Um, and human-like primates were all around the world. But the group of human-like primates that evolved into humans lived in Africa at the time. And so humans originated from Africa. They literally, they were nowhere else but Africa at one point in time, because of course at one point in time there was only one human. But we talked about that a few classes ago when we were talking about speciation and how the lines are fuzzy. But anyway, so modern humans, Homo sapiens, evolved in Africa. And then they spread out all across Africa. They're a hugely successful species. Um, and then one tribe of those African many African populations um, went through oh, what's that peninsula called? The Middle East and then branched out into Europe down uh, probably along the coast through China up across Alaska down the Americas into Australia um, 
And so it's also why African genetic diversity is so much greater than all the rest of humans, because all of the rest of, of the world, the humans came from a single bottleneck, a small group of um, humans that went out of Africa. And we now think that there were two times that humans went out of Africa. Whereas um, those other groups in Africa were much more diverse, which is why actually Africans are a much more diverse group than pretty much everyone else on the planet, which I think is really cool. So yes, we are technically all Africans. Um, although given the modern understanding of the word, I'm not quite sure you should go around saying you're African because that will just be confusing. Unless you're from Africa, in which case, nice. I should visit more. I've only been to one country. Um, which of Dawkins' books do you most recommend? I most recommend Selfish G because it was the first one I read and it is not only a good read, but a biologically important, like a scientifically important book. And it's very rare that the two come together, that there is a book that has had a huge impact on the scientific field and also is just a fun book to read. Um, I've not read so i've read that one many times i've not read the others cover to cover in the same way um it depends on what you want your focus to be on he has his more biological books he has his more atheist books you can choose where on that spectrum you want to go but i think he's a very good um convincing writer and he has a wonderful way with words um so i would say start with selfish gene and go from there. Uh, if you were to give one reason why it matters for everyone to learn about evolution, what would it be? Oh, now we're talking about why people should learn. Because I'm like, well, because it's fun. Because it's not my initial thought, it's because it's fascinating. And I derive so much um, pleasure entertainment in the true sense so i find knowing about evolution so gratifying and the process of learning about evolution so gratifying in and of itself that there is an intrinsic reward to studying life to knowing more about the living things we see around us from a more pragmatic point of view um if we were, uh, what was it again? Uh, what one reason why it matters for everyone to learn about evolution? Um, because it affects our own health is probably the most pragmatic reason. Um, it affects because it affects farming, because it affects disease, because it affects why we have weird bodies our bodies are so like like who came up with the eye where you put the blood vessels in front of the bit that detects light like how stupid is that or so many um diseases we have because we've got these bodies that weren't created in one go they were created through the process of evolution which is very flawed um i mean obviously I am assuming that religion is not going around, in this scenario, I'm assuming that religion is not going around providing a false alternative to evolution. Um, so, yeah, so my first answer would be because it's fun. My second answer would be because it's true. And my third answer would be because it affects us directly in our health and our food. Um, okay, I'm going to take two more questions. Uh, let's have a look. Um, I, oh, I saw what about the Abrema Cacao. Am I, uh, I won't take this, am I got any more plans about uh, making a hardier version of cho the chocolate plant? I am planning a video on chocolate. That's all I'll say. Um... What animal do you think will what animal do you think will be the next dominant species if humans go extinct? Well, firstly, it's when humans go extinct rather than if humans go extinct, because 
just in terms of billions of years, no one single species has lasted billions of years. It is inevitable that we will go extinct. Uh, what will become the dominant species? It's odd because thinking back, I'm not sure there has been a single species that has dominated in quite the same way that humans have. Obviously, we can think of like the age of the dinosaurs, but dinosaurs were a huge group of species. And at any one time, I don't think they had the same impact on the world that we do now. Um, so hopefully, there, I mean, in an ideal balanced system, you wouldn't have a dominant species. You would have no single species would be causing so much damage on everything else. Um, so, yeah, I suppose I hope that there isn't one. It would have to be adaptable to take over the world. Because, like, like, I don't know, take something like a fruit fly, because it's what I study. They are found everywhere except Antarctica, just like humans. Because um, they're found alongside humans. But just because it's everywhere, and there are more of them than there are of humans, we don't see it as a dominant species. And that's because it hasn't impacted on the environment so much. So, I think it's very difficult to say. And I don't think that any one time Earth always has a dominant species. I think that we're in unusual circumstances. But that's a great question. One final question. Um... <gasps> Sorry, I'm just watching everyone. Someone's like, it's actually ants? Um, it will be ants. Or, um... Isn't it dolphins? And dolphins are like, no, they don't have any hands. It won't be dolphins that take over. I love this. Um, what about bacteria that coexist with the ants? Oh, I love you lot. You're great. Uh, octopus. Oh, I think octopus are too smart to properly take over. I, I don't think octopuses would be stupid enough to cause their own demise, which I think is kind of how humans are going to end. Even if it's just through disease from overcrowding. Um, uh, one final question. If there was one evolutionary mistake that you could magically correct, what would that be? So I just did a podcast. Um, I was a guest on the Level Up Human podcast that was coming out two weeks time, I think, where you're trying to level up humans. You're trying to improve on human biology. And the point I gave there was we should have... It, so it didn't have to be necessarily realistic. Uh, my point is we should have selective ovulation because periods suck. And the reason we have periods is because embryos are greedy little mother mms. Um, and... <laughs> they literally want to bathe in their mother's blood at the expense of their mother and so having periods is one part of a system that helps humans control against their own offspring um so there's that <laughs> i'm not a fan of pregnancy if you can't tell um oh but what mistake oh oh Because there's always trade-offs. What's a big mistake? I mean, yeah, in terms of humans, like our eyes are back to front. We only have one hole for breathing rather than two, so we have a really inefficient breathing system. You end up with a lot of stale air in your lungs. We have whole nerves that divert around arteries just because that's the way the embryos were. Um, we've got random... If you do that and you get that tendon there is used to be the tendon for retracting claws. Obviously we don't need that now. But most of them are pretty harmless. Um, I'm sure there's something to do with hips. 
we haven't sorted out our hips yet as humans because we in evolutionary time we quite recently went upright and i don't think we've quite sorted that out um someone's saying remove nipples so i just don't think that nipples is a big enough problem um yeah back pain has got to be a pretty big one i think uh, we haven't quite, I don't know what it is exactly, but we haven't quite perfected bipedalism yet. Um, and there has got to be something in there. Um, someone says hips are a trade-off for moving and giving birth. Oh, actually giving birth, we don't think is, we don't think that hips are the reason why humans give birth at nine months anymore. Alice Roberts did a fantastic documentary about that. We think it's more about um, nutrient resources. Um, yeah, breathing and eating through the same orifice isn't so bad, but it does mean you can choke. Um, interesting, snakes. I always wonder, because you see a snake uh, dislocate its jaw and swallow like an egg. You're like, why doesn't that squash its windpipe? It's because we have a C-shaped bit of cartilage around our windpipe, so it can expand and contract a little bit. They have a full O shape around um, their windpipe so that the force of the egg pushing down the esophagus doesn't close up their trachea. Um, so... Maybe the... Oh, actually, Timothy Luscombe's got it. Wisdom teeth. Quite a lot of good they are. The reason is, is because we used to have more teeth because we used to have to chew our food more, but since cooking, we didn't have to. So our jaws have shrunk, but our number of teeth have stayed the same. And that causes quite a lot of problems. So take your pick, but I do really like that question. In fact, I've liked all of your questions. I've really enjoyed not responding to your comments through this lecture series. Um, I have been reading your comments. Um, I just didn't want to always be getting off topic and to roughly get everything fitting into a one hour slot. Um, but yes, thank you so much everyone for joining me for these eight weeks. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I feel like I've contributed something during the lockdown, which is nice. It's given me a bit of structure. Um, as always, thank you to people on Patreon, thank you to people on PayPal, thank you to people who have just been watching and haven't been able to donate at all. Um, you are all lovely people. Um, and I will be putting up all of the like whiteboards and um, I might even put up my lesson plans on Patreon as a resource you can just download. Uh, if you donated through PayPal, not Patreon, just send me an email and I'll send it over to you. It's not like I'm precious about it. Um, but if that's something you want, um, I'll stick it up on there. I, I also cannot believe it has been eight weeks. Um, but it has. So all that remains, oh, and I may have done a special little thing and put, um, oh, actually, I did a special little thing. So I have now got the full outro music and not just a 60 second version of it. So I can talk over it now. Um, Thanks for coming. I will still be making videos on this channel, but they will be the usual edited ones. I may at some point come back to do Evolution Live Part 2, which will be more of the fun things like social evolution and behavioural ecology and stuff like that. Stay safe during lockdown. Follow whatever regulations there are around you. And I hope you have a lovely rest of Thursday, wherever you are. And enjoy being alive.